so we're back. I'm going to finish reading this article by uh, the anthropologist Alf Hornborg. It's called Animism, Fetishism, and Objectivism. <clears throat> Probably because animism would imply such moral constraints upon uh, our exploitation of the environment. The few Western scientists who have seriously championed an animistic worldview have inexorably been relegated to the margins, not because their arguments have been shown to be invalid, but because, predictably, they have been found irrelevant to the modern project. I am thinking here not of theologians or philosophers, but natural scientists, and would briefly like to mention two such scientific animists of the 20th century whose contributions continue to haunt us. The first is the Estonian zoologist Jacob von Juxkul, uh, who wrote in, uh, published in 1940, who created his own version of theoretical biology by focusing on the obvious but neglected fact that all living organisms inhabit their own subjective worlds, their umwelt, defined by their sensory capacities, in reminding us that organisms are not mere metabolism, but live by the exchange and interpretation of signs, Yuke School provided us with the possibility of a radically different science of ecology. Ecosystems, in this perspective, are not merely flows of energy and matter, but even more fundamentally flows of signs. For without these communicative flows between myriads of living subjects, the material flows which preoccupy mainstream ecologists would simply not exist. Nature, in other words, is just as much founded on communication as the human social realm from which modern Europeans have banished it. Yuxkul would have found himself at home among the Ashwar people, or the Cree, who recognize that human communication is but a subset of the communication that goes on within the total community of living things. But predictably, Western biology found little use for his ambition to approach organisms as subjects. Although he is recognized as one of, as one of the founders of ethology, the study of animal behavior, and although he deserves to be mentioned in any study of biological communication, for instance, the recent discovery of pheromones, the primary interest of Western scientists is not to get to know living organisms as subjects, but as objects. The second scientific animist that I would like to mention is Gregory Bateson, whom anthropologists like to think of as one of the giants of 20th century anthropology, but whose creativity spans several other fields, including psychiatry, ethology, and biology. He applied a remarkably consistent approach to the study of incredibly diverse things, from rituals in Highland New Guinea to schizophrenia, alcoholism, animal behavior, evolutionary theory, and ecological crisis. The common denominator, again, was communication. Bateson showed how living things, their attributes, and their behavior are everywhere molded by the communicative relations in which they are engaged. Bateson, too, would have been at home among the Ashwar or the Cree. For him, environmental crisis was a crisis of communication, but the ultimate response of mainstream Western scientists has been a peculiar mixture of admiration and puzzlement. Fascinating, but how do we use it? Yes, how indeed. If the, economic, or if the systematic modern denial of relatedness is somehow at the root of ecological crisis, as many environmentalists believe, what are our prospects for resurrecting it? It is difficult to imagine that modern society as an act of, an, of instrumental reason should begin inculcating in its citizens the long-term ecological validity of pre-modern metaphors of what Bird David in 1993 calls subject-subject relatedness. However much we admire the eco-cosmologies of the Nayaka, the Ashwar, or the Cree, we should not expect to encounter them anywhere but in the anthropology departments, and definitely not in mainstream textbooks in ecology or sustainable development nor can we put much hope in what has become known as New Age spirituality. The movement as such is highly relevant from the point of view of this discussion, but it is a flimsy platform on which to build a future, a postmodern symptom of epistemological collapse rather than an advance on modernity. 
when neo-pagans and other New Age enthusiasts proclaim that this or that sacred site possesses such strong energy, it seems as if they are indeed struggling for relatedness, for a restoration of meaning beyond the existential wasteland of modernity, but remain confined to the modernist and, in fact, scientific vocabulary through which objective properties are attributed to distinct external things. Surrounded by philosophers and sociologists of science announcing the end of Cartesian objectivism and acknowledging the extent to which human meanings infuse the material world, anthropologists discussing animistic understandings of nature will now be excused for taking them more seriously than a generation ago. But rather than going native or adopting some version of New Age spirituality, it is incumbent on us to analytically sort out what epistemological options there are and to ask why pre-modern, modern, and post-modern people will tend to deal with subject-object relations in such different ways. We might begin by suggesting that the objects, in the sense of a material, intrinsically meaningless but essentially knowable reality, is a thoroughly modern invention. If modernity is built on the subject-object dichotomy, this implies that whatever pre-modern people had to worry about, it was not epistemology. Whichever interpretive schemes conventionally adhered to in pre-modern societies, they enjoyed a kind of immutable authority that modern knowledge rarely achieves. It is the predicament of modern people to remain chronically uncertain about the validity of their own representations. This modern condition of reflexive uncertainty can either be harnessed in a production of new but provisional certainties, as in science, or assume the form of solipsism, disengagement, and indifference. The latter alternative is what we have come to know as the postmodern. It is a condition where the exhausting attitude of chronic skepticism tends to give way to a kind of resigned gullibility. All hope of certainty has vanished, but precisely because no pretense to power or truth can be admitted, any pretense is as good as any other. Witness the claims of the neo-pagans, for example. As in the pre-modern condition, a sign is again naively perceived as an unproblematic index of identity, rather than an arbitrary symbolic convention demanding to be challenged, but now simply by virtue of positing itself as such, rather than because of an assumed correspondence with some underlying essence. This postmodern abandonment of essence is what Baudrillard, in 1973, has aptly called the autonomization of the signifier. The problem with objectivism, as unimaginable for the pre-moderns as it is unacceptable for the postmoderns, is the notion of a knowledge that is not situated as part of a relation. By posing as disinterested representation, decontextualized from any political aspiration, modernist knowledge, pre uh, modernist knowledge production suggests a relinquishment of responsibility, but in fact serves, through technology, to set the instrumental rationality of the powerful free to go about its business in the world. But the postmodern mirror image of, a, of objectivism, that is, relativism, certainly fares no better in terms of responsibility. Both these epistemologies have been spawned by the same modern subject-object dichotomy. The division into natural versus human sciences, pitting realism against constructivism in Western knowledge production, remains a projection of this fundamentally existential dualist scheme. The former takes the represented object as its point of departure, the latter the constructing subject but neither acknowledges their recursivity, that is, their relation. One reason why animism continues to intrigue us may be that this is precisely what animism does. Rather than viewing knowledge as either representation or construction, animism suggests the intermediate view that knowledge is a relation that shapes both the knower and the known. An animistic or relational ontology is a mode of knowing that is not only constitutive of both the knower and the known, as is all knowledge according to the cognitive scientists like uh, 
Maturana and Varela, but that crucially also acknowledges this fundamental condition and thus also the responsibilities that must always adhere to the very act of knowing. Beyond objectivism and relativism, there can only be relationalism, if only because purely instrumental knowledge and rational risk assessment can never be as powerful incentives for human action as moral imperatives. We, we do need new metaphors capable of sustainably relating us to the rest of the biosphere. Animism raises our curiosity as the hesitant acknowledgement of suppressed childhood experiences, the assertion of which would challenge the entire modern project. As I suggested earlier, we were all born pre-modern. Relatedness is a condition that all of us continue to be capable of achieving in particular experiential contexts of some minimal duration. Our modern, our modernity, our, inclina our inclination toward abstraction detachment and objectification is the product of our disembedding biographies. It is in being involuntarily deprived of relatedness that we become Cartesianists. The powerful historical trajectory of, objectiv of objectivism relies on a particular recursivity, on a peculiar recursivity between social disembeddedness, Cartesian epistemology, and technology ultimately, that is, between individual existence and socio-technical power structures. The epistemological predicament articulated by Descartes was not so much an innovative cognitive shift from animism to objectivism as the emergence or unprecedented generalization of a social condition of alienation. Through processes of increasing commodification and alienation, and more recently through the proliferation of new technological hybrids in the Taurus sense, the social condition of modernity has accentuated our anxieties about where or how to draw boundaries between persons and things, amplifying a pervasive Cartes Cartesian dissociation of self from non-self that, as, as we have seen, is the root of both solipsism and objectivism. To the extent that we can and do continue to animate our favorite trees, houses, cars, or teddy bears. It is because we continue to need concrete reference points onto which to anchor ourselves. It is the long immersion in the concrete and experiential specifics of place that yields conditions conducive to relatedness. These are the irreplaceable persons, localities, and things. This, if anything, should provide us with clues about the prospects for resurrecting relational ontologies. But there is another and supremely modernist way in which things can be animated, which has come, which has to do not with experiential resonance, but with ideology and political economy. Animation is in fact fundamental to fetishism, and fetishism, to Karl Marx, was central to modern capitalism. It is indeed important to know how animism relates to fetishism. There is a crucial difference between representing relations between people as if they were relations between things, which is Marxian fetishism, and experiencing relations to things as if they were relations to people, animism. The former, Marxist fetishism, is an ideological illusion underpinning capitalist political economy the latter a condition of phenomenological resonance. We should, we should probably further distinguish between the animation of living things, such as trees, which is animism more narrowly defined, and that of non-living things, such, such as stones or machines, that is, fetishism. Cartesian objectivism and fetishism here emerge as structural inversions of one another. The former denies agency and subjectivity in living beings, whereas the latter attributes such qualities to inert objects. In this framework, a more strictly defined category of animism would be reserved for the, in, for the intermediate and quite reasonable assumption that all living things are subjects, i.e., are equipped with a certain capacity for perception, communication, and agency. Animism, fetishism, and objectivism can thus be understood as alternative responses to universal human problems of drawing boundaries between persons and things. <laughs>